everyone, my name is AJ, this is the Mighty Blue Stick channel and this is the fourth and last video on the player character class, The Wizard. How do I make these videos so quickly? It must be magic. Today we are going to talk about the arcane schools of necromancy and transformation, oh sorry, transmutation, and about alchemy, artifice, and the creation of magical items, wondrous objects, and artifacts, and other spellcasting classes and their relationship with wizardry, and about the role wizards have in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. First, a bit about necromancy. The school of necromancy, much like conjuration, is perhaps not the best, most accurate name for it, but this is what people call it, and it has negative connotations for well-deserved reasons. Nobody would argue otherwise on that point. Uh, though the art of necromancy, um, and through it, the dead bodies of people can be reanimated. And let me just be clear, these are people... Wives, husbands, fathers, children, city officials, friends, and familiar faces. While we talk casually about the turning bodies, dead bodies, into undead servants, the worlds these games are set in have a much smaller population than our real world, and the people know these zombies. It's horrific to them, it's hurtful to them, and it's insulting to the memory of those bodies, who those bodies were. So we, we must keep this in mind. However, and this is, I imagine, will make some of you a little bit happy. I don't think necromancy is a school of magic that is only of interest to evil wizards. In fact, I imagine that this is a subject that draws interest from most wizards, and for one very good reason. Tell me, how long do wizards live? In fantasy fiction, <laughs> wizards commonly have greatly extended lifespans, so we are so used to this that we barely even question it. And yet, here on page 118 of the Player's Handbook for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, under the innocuous, if somewhat ominous, subheading of Grim Harvest, we see that even low-level wizards of the necromancy arcane tradition have attained the ability to draw and absorb life energy from living creatures that they have killed with their spells. They can regain their own hit points at a rate of twice the level of the spell used to kill the target, once per turn three times the spell level if it is specifically of the necromancy school, this spell that they use. The magic used can be nothing more than a first level spell, and it doesn't specify what sort of living creature need perish this way. Could it be an ordinary housefly? Could it be a garden weed? The point is, while at first glance this seems like an act of evil since it is predatory in nature, um, it need not be something that involves suffering, and it works just as well with living creatures that are not sentient. If you want to say this is like vegan necromancy, go right ahead. It's funny, and it illustrates that necromancy can be no more evil than eating a salad. So, already that we see that this is a complicated subject, and we can only start to, um, we've only started to investigate it. In the last video, I talked about how magic can be abused and disrupt the natural world, causing devastation and corruption such as on the world of Arthas of the Dark Sun campaign setting, or numerous locations in Faerun, such as the area around the Sunless Citadel, where a Shardalon went into a full-on dragon rage and just blasted the train so hard that plants still don't grow there. There is still a lot we don't know about the structure of the universe, our universe, and the Dungeons and Dragons universe has the additional complication that it's not actually real. So, suffice to say, I, would profess, I, I wouldn't profess to be one who knows how arcane energies can take life force away or transfer it or even replace it entirely with what we call negative energy. We have no equivalent energy exchange like this as a base of, of comparison, um, but we can certainly imagine what this would be like in a fantasy world. In previous videos, I have talked about the undead and in the creation and manipulation of undead creatures. Necromancy is pretty firmly in the camp of evil activities, or at the very least extremely unsavory, risky ventures that if not carefully handled can spiral out of control drastically. Undead plague it comes to mind. Much like golems are animated by summoning and constraining elemental beings of a very alien extra-dimensional energy form, again, something we have no equivalent of, sh short of the proto-electronic digital life forms that we're only now starting to create. Boy, I can make a video on that. Many simple undead are uh, created by summoning and constraining negative energy spirits inside dead flesh. Most, but, of, but not all, uh, the crawling claw being a notable exception. In D&D, a zombie or skeleton left to its own devices either does nothing, follows a set of instructions to the letter, or methodically kills any living thing around it. Why do they do this? 
why are they drawn driven to kill the living i can't really tell you perhaps it's just a hatred of things that are alien to them perhaps it's a drive to re recreate the environment they're drawn from in older editions of the game there was a negative energy plane or an, an eternal void where lifeless barren worlds stocked with lurking undead and disembodied spirits um, and tormented maddened souls many undead manifest some sort of predatory drive an insatiable void within them that must be compulsively uh, filled they attempt to fill it but never actually do they are out of balance with the natural world the existence of the undead um, the existence of a, of a thinking creature that's undead such as a ghoul or a vampire um, it's a tormented one it would inspire pity if it wasn't for the merciless danger that they represent Wizards know the, these dangers and they flirt with them. They know the legends of creation, the ability of, of gods to create life itself. And many wizards of previous eras have devoted their entire lives to finding out how. But without divine power themselves, arcane magic can never create more living energy than there is already. And entropy will always sap some of that away in the form of an exchange. So most wizards greatly extend their lives with the justification that with their great power and understanding of the world they can have more of an impact and steer the course of history. And in many cases this is exactly what they do. Other wizards come to the conclusion that even if they can extend their lives they're still vulnerable so they embraced entropy and undeath becoming liches. And yes in the um, elven arcane traditions there is such a thing as a Baelnorn, a willing elf that serves its clan beyond death. These were supposed to have had their life their own life granted by the elven divine uh, pantheon of gods however many of them were transformed via arcane rather than divine divine rituals so they still have phylacteries however um, either version was less corrupted than a normal lich and they still look dead but they are not supernaturally terrifying necromancers dedicate themselves to the study of these energies and entities we don't have in the real world they investigate sites where murders have taken place, where people have taken their own lives in great tra tragedy and sorrow, or died um, reputedly full of rage, shame, or remorse. Strong emotions combined with death in the Dungeons and Dragons world can have dire consequences. So that's something to keep in mind. Tragedy leads to undeath in the undead world. This is this is a fact of their life. We don't have in ours. They instruct the clergy sometimes um, on how to deal with undead monsters because some of these creatures are intelligent and have been around for centuries so divine orders that have only established themselves recently even a few decades ago may have no text or living experts on the matter um, and while the power of the gods is usually sufficient they are still vulnerable to infiltration assassination and vile corruption by intelligent undead so you can imagine a secret meeting between a necromancer and a church elder not exactly something the church would want to advertise but i'd imagine it goes on the necromancers as you can imagine require areas inside the wizard academy to store bodies modify and reconstruct them perform rituals on them and animate them despite how easy it would be to manufacture their own servant staff they prefer to keep the halls and rooms private quarters studies and laboratories free of any undead and never never let an undead out of their line of sight all it takes is some city officials aspiring apprentice nephew getting their face chewed off by an unsupervised ghoul to throw the academy into disrepute and chaos. Necromancers have some unexpected practical uses though that can serve to save lives. They can put people into suspended animation if they're ever trapped in a sealed area with low air reserves for instance. So that sort of um, you know spell could feign death could be very useful in a mining operation. A scroll of feign death. Uh, several of them even magic jar can be used to save people if you think go about it uh, very creatively but of course necromancers can directly restore life using the raise the dead spell the power of life and death the pathway to immortality these are powerful laws lures for any spellcaster and necromancy is a lot more common in private study than i think wizards let the out world, outside world know finally the school of transmutation the art of modifying the natural world, matter and energy from one thing into something else. Take a moment to look at the list of spells and see how dominated they are by transmutation spells. Along with the school of evocation, transmutation would be a large organization within the Wizarding Academy and it would be further subdivided into more specialized branches. These, um, those who deal with spells of personal enhancement, 
those who deal with energy manipulation, those who concentrate on matter manipulation, those who research the work of other famous wizards and carry on innovating new applications for the magical arts. I imagine wizarding um, history is intimately tied in with that. All apprentices, all of them, learn spells from the transmutation school. It's almost like the basic curriculum for the first couple of years, as it does touch on all other forms of magic anyway, so serves to educate and give experience of the different schools to the apprentices so that they can narrow their focus as they progress. You know, it's a sampler. Some wizards are less trusting of the effects that rely solely on energy and willpower and instead concentrate on more tangible technology of potions and wondrous items. So alchemists and artificers usually have their roots firmly planted in the eclectic halls of the transmutation school. And what a place it is. The first impression you would be struck by when entering the parts of the academy claimed by the transmuters, which is a major part of the academy, is that these people treat the laws of the natural world with some degree of scorn. Um, they're here in hallways with people walking around on the ceiling as well as the floor, taking books from shelves and going about their business. There are drinking fountains where water flows out of uh, rock bowls and back into the stone bowls somehow. There are clockwork automata whirling around, along with books and notes that have gossamer wings fluttering past on the way from sender to receiver. There's golems. There are exotic materials, plants and animals from other dimensions. Uh, doorways may be made of silver that flows aside as you walk through it. Access may be via stairs or levitating platforms. The air is mountain fresh and the place is usually immaculately clean and the temperature is a nice comfortable temperature. There's a hushed quality. Sound doesn't travel very far and light seems to shine without any focused source, though the wizards prefer images and familiarity of candles and lanterns. Um, they're not necessary. Most walls have books on a bewildering array of subjects that may tend to be practical examinations of the unique solutions nature has for overcoming things, and detailed studies of additional ways that nature has not uh, yet developed. Transmutation draws all sorts of personalities, from those who thrill with the personal superpowers that they can grant themselves, to those who need to have a solution for every situation, the MacGyver mages. The action and innovation of the transmutation school means that there is really a dull moment day to day. Transmutation uh, has previously been known as the school of alteration, and a fascinating sub-school is that of the wizards who become obsessed with the ability to polymorph into other forms. So don't be too alarmed if you suddenly come face to face with a large tiger sitting in an embroidered cushion and reading a book on metallurgy. He looks up and says, how do you do? A lot of very famous wizards are transmuters. Also, anyone who's played the Neverwinter Nights 2 Mask of the Betrayer will know the character uh, Sapphire, the Red Wizard of Thay, an instructor of the Academy of Shapers and Binders. Her mother, uh, Nephris, was the headmistress of the academy. Transmuters are prevalent and influential. They concern themselves with raw materials and trade, rare substances being something they earn quite a lot of money for. The impressive amount of wealth that the school generates means they typically have a dominant hand in the politics and leadership of the academy itself and interactions with the outside world, and the facility is built around their organisational needs. For those of you who have read uh, Patrick Rutherford's book, The Name of the Wind, the crafting of wondrous items forms an important element of the way the apprentice wizard, quote, and bard, becomes proficient in the mystic arts and elevates his standard of living. That's a really, really good book. I can highly recommend it. Uh, required reading. Don't forget, all of these apprentice wizards learning how to make magical items are making magical items. They're making magical items, and most of them work. Well, plus a few of them that don't work very well, um, will eventually be sold and then traded and dispersed widely. So academies are the forges of basic wondrous items and most likely origin of the most rare and expensive items as the academy is a location where access to very rare and expensive resources and materials can be found easily. Um, as you can imagine, they don't just let people wander around the academy, particularly the laboratories and workshops the wizards spend a large amount of their time in. The more advanced the wizards become in their special projects and training, the more secure and secluded their quarters and work areas are, since a busy transmuter often leaves their work notes and constructions open and in progress, which can be lethal for anyone who thinks messing around with them is in any way a good idea. Health and safety is not extremely high on the priorities of these wizards as those who are stupid enough to get a limb blown off or get themselves poisoned have no place in the school anyway as far as they're concerned. They're intellectual elitists. 
The line where the transmuter ends and the alchemist or artificer begins is a very fuzzy one, but you could say it's where they spend less time casting spells at things and more time casting spells into things. It's subtle but distinctive differentiation. The creation of artifacts is a whole other level of magic that goes way beyond any particular school of magic, even beyond wizarding academies themselves. Artifacts are extremely diverse. They can be divine in nature, they can be well, they're typically deeply involved in historical events, and they're as rare as hen's teeth. Artifacts are really about the plot of the game, and they are very specialised in potent objects that facilitate the story. They are best used when things need to ramp up, when the stakes get very high, and crucially, when you, the dungeon master, trust your players to be in so involved with the campaign world that they would rather see the story progress and be active in telling it themselves than to misuse an artifact and throw the story into chaos. Because artifacts certainly have the potential to do that, a great example of course being the deck of many things, broken many a game which is unprepared for it. Touching on other subjects of interest to the commenters, thank you very much. How do Eldritch Knights fit into the Wizarding Society? Very good question. As mentioned in the first videos, uh, abjurers spend a fair amount of time acting outside the academy in the role of magic cops, and it is perfectly reasonable that they would interact with martial classes, fighters, city guards, criminal investigators, men-at-arms in the employ of noble houses, many of whom have the mental talent required for mystic study, but have never actually pursued that profession for one reason or another. I mean, not all clever people gravitate towards intellectual pursuits. And the demands of mastering martial combat arts is as challenging both the body and mind as just the, the mental activities of abjuration, for instance. Abjurers cement ties with talented individuals by teaching them spells and theory from the schools of abjuration and evocation. They have a mandate to do so. It's in their best interest of the academy. In fact, just a simple demonstration of how effective Blade Ward, True Strike and Firebolt can be, all of them cantrips, is really all it takes to convince um, a fighter that gaining access to further training um, is a good idea and this forms the basis of the relationship between the abjurers, the school and these eldritch knights. And potential service to the Wizarding Academy or general hierarchy of wizards who share information and provide training in your campaign environment it doesn't have to be a centralised academy. So, threats to the academy or its faculty and students will no doubt attract the attention of Eldritch Knights who are probably more than happy to secure and defend the source of their supernatural combat edge. Okay, that about does it for the wizard character class. I hope this overview has helped to solidify the various schools of magic in your mind and inspired lots of ideas for your game. As always, comments and questions are more than welcome down below. I'll be covering uh, warlocks and sorcerers, witches and things in separate videos. Thank you for all your feedback everyone and for voting on druids as the next class to cover. I'll be back again soon with another Monster Ecology video. As always, thank you very much for listening.